Hamilton Park celebrates the millennium with four new exciting rides. The Inverter, Kite Flyer, Family Fun Rides, Demolition Derby, and Turtle World. And don't forget, Chaos. discount coupons at McDonald's. Clementon Park opened back in 1907 and has operated ever since until 2019. It is one of the last trolley parks in America. The park has been operated by numerous people and undergone years of constant change, for better or worse. The future has looked uncertain, but for now, let's go all the way back. Theodore B. Gibbs was born in 1838 and was a New Jersey assemblyman and a Civil War veteran. Throughout his life, he worked many jobs like a postmaster and a sheriff. He was also a member of the Atlantic City Railroad Board of Directors. Trolley lines became increasingly popular back in the early 1900s as a way of encouraging people to take trips to amusement parks as they attracted many weekend visitors. Many of these guests would come from neighboring Camden in search of new experiences during their leisure time. The first ride on Clementon Park's property was added all the way back in 1906. The ride, called Aerial Wave, used three men who held a large wooden ring. Attached to a rope, they ran in a circle to spin the small gondola. This was the first ever attraction at Clementon Park, the start of over 100 years of history. One year later, the trolley lines from Haddon Heights were extended to the property. Clementon Park was officially founded in 1907 by Theodore and was the first amusement park in the area. The property is now the second oldest amusement park in the state of New Jersey, having been open for over 110 years. It all started with a small picnic grove and beach, a showcase that anything can become something with the right dedication, plan, and leadership. In a tragic turn of events, during the month of October in 1909, Theodore Gibbs passed away, and the park was left to his family to continue what he had started two years earlier. While his passing was a tragedy, the family continued with their expansion plans. Coming off the loss of Theodore, the park's management added new attractions and experiences to entice the public. These new attractions included an open-air pavilion, an increased fleet of boats to 100 for the lake, and a baseball diamond that was billed as, quote, one of the finest in the country. In 1912, Mary Gibbs, the wife of Theodore, gifted the property of Clementon Park, nearby houses, and the old grist mill to her three sons. This would be the start of the expansion and growth of the area. With the new management being appointed, the three sons of Theodore added multiple attractions, a Nickelodeon movie theater, a quote, dancing casino, and one of the most important, a steam-driven carousel. The carousel, built by the Philadelphia Toboggan Company, was a 1919 carousel with three rows and 48 horses, and a model number of number 49. One final ride was installed for the 1919 season and would be the first coaster at the park. Known as Jackrabbit, this coaster stood at a height of 50 feet, featuring a top speed of 35 miles per hour and a length of 1,380 feet. The coaster was certainly not small for its time. Being designed by legendary coaster engineer John A. Miller, this coaster would become a staple of the park for decades to come. The coaster only cost a mere $80,000, which would be approximately $1.2 million in 2022. 
the addition of Jackrabbit would help Clementon Park to flourish in the following years. Many more rides would be added to the park as the years passed. These included a Noah's Ark attraction. This is a walkthrough funhouse style attraction where the boat would rock back and forth to give the illusion of it being on water. These were extremely popular at the time and could once be found at nearly all major amusement parks. Only one Noah's Ark continues to operate today at Kennywood Park in West Mifflin, Pennsylvania. Other attractions added in this time period would be a whip attraction, shooting gallery, and Ferris wheel. Despite these additions, the park would face an assortment of negative backlash from the public. The rest of the 1920s would include a lawsuit regarding Noah's Ark, a tax cut war for the park, and the quote, Clementon Death Lake around the swimming grounds, making this an era of the park that may have not been the most kind regarding the public's viewpoint. The 30s seemed to have started out well with a new penny arcade, but the year of 1931 was one that now seems to have been lost to history. This year was to be remembered as the year of the Great Fire. According to the New York Times, quote, a vivid pyrotechnic display and the successive reports of exploding cartridges added to the spectacular aspect of a fire which swept through part of Clementon Park, a South Jersey pleasure resort. The fire had reached the cartridge supply of the shooting gallery, setting off explosions. Firemen from six adjoining towns fought the fire, which was contained to the shooting gallery and a nearby pretzel dark ride. The damages were estimated to be $2,000, equal to nearly $34,000 today. This fire could have destroyed the entire park if not for the actions of all the firemen involved in containing the blaze. After such a devastating event, surely things would calm down but the following year of 1932 brought something even stranger. Socialist presidential candidate Norman Thomas campaigned at Clementon Park in 1932 at a July 4th speech in front of 3,500 people. More occurrences like this would happen in 1936 with Philadelphia boxer Al Ator. He trained at Clementon Park for the heavyweight title fight against Joe Lewis to occur in Philadelphia on September 22, 1936. Thousands of boxing fans visited the park to see a tour train. Multiple events also took place throughout the 1930s and 1950s at Clementon Park's ballroom. These events included hosted dance marathons. Various celebrities such as Red Skelton and Dick Clark were hosts on certain dates. These were some of the biggest names the park's venues ever hosted, still being recognized to this day. Clementon Park also hosted dance marathons to help survive the Depression. The prizes were $100 to partners who lasted the longest. It's safe to say that the park was involved in much more than just amusements back in its heyday, getting into anything they could to find an audience of customers. In 1977, the Gibbs family sold Clementon Lake Park to Abram Baker. This marked an end to the family's run which began when Theodore Gibbs founded the property. With this came a new era for the park, which would last a while. Abram Baker was a businessman who had experience owning a nightclub in Miami, Florida, but this was not his first venture into amusement parks. He served as the owner of Glen Echo Park in Maryland from 1955 to 1968, but his ownership of Clementon would be different. Baker was not able to dedicate the time necessary for operating an amusement park, so one of his sons, Larry Baker, was appointed as the general manager. In 2007, I wrote the Clementon installment of Arcadia Publishing's Images of America book series. I have not lived in Clementon for some time, about 20 years, but I volunteer with the Clementon Historical Commission and really just enjoy growing the artifacts, photographs, body of research, and findings related to the town's really cool history. In the mid-1980s, my parents bought a house in Clementon, told us we were moving there. And I find it interesting that even though this move was all of one mile from Lindenwald to Clementon, I remember feeling so excited that we were moving to the town with the amusement park. And I vividly remember standing in my backyard and the other kids, the neighbors commenting on it, saying things like, you're going to get to go to Clementon Park all the time, which obviously did not happen. Nothing really changed. But I think it serves as a testament to the excitement among children and that sense that 
Clemson had this really notable, exciting thing attached to it. Even as a child, I think I recognized that there was something a little bit special about having this amusement park almost in my backyard. A gentleman named Abe Baker, I never, I never met him. I know at some point, I believe, he ran some businesses in Miami and Atlantic City. He bought the park in the late 1970s. And Abe Baker had three sons. Um, I met one of his sons, Larry, briefly around the time I was writing my book in the early 2000s. My sense is that Larry was the son who um, had the largest hand in running the park through the 80s and 90s and until it was sold in the, in the early 2000s. I, I remember um, meeting Larry briefly and his office was covered in all sorts of park memorabilia that, that interested me, old photos and I think maybe some, if I recall correctly, some vintage amusement park art that he probably brought with him. But no, I didn't really have much interaction with him. Doris, it's Clementon Park's greatest ride ever, King Neptune's Revenge. But Harry, it's just for kids. One of the biggest log flume rides in the whole country. Just for kids, Harry. Uh, no, it's great fun, Doris, for everybody. But it, it's just for... Oh, my God! Like you and me, Doris? Come to Clementon Park's grand opening this weekend. Clowns, gifts, magic, and new kitty ride. In 1983, the park added the King Neptune Log Flume. This log flume, built by Intamin, was an exciting new attraction notable for using the lake setting to its advantage. The ride is seen as the park's first major turning point in years and showed that the bakers were willing to invest money into keeping the park growing for years to come. Such an optimistic outlook for the park's future did not last long, as according to several newspapers, there were 11 injuries on the log flume in its opening year. This would prove to only be a minor setback, however, as the ride reopened shortly after. Following the log flume's opening, the park's focus would turn to much smaller events and additions, and it would also find use as a filming location, such as in 1984 when Diana Ross filmed a music video there. In 1988, three new attractions were added to the park. Among these additions were the Sea Dragon, a pirate ship ride that still runs to this day. At some point during the 1990s, the historic carousel would be auctioned off. Each horse was sold separately for a fraction of what they were worth. The purpose of this was reportedly to raise money to continue the operation of the park. This was the end of the historic ride's time on property. At this point in the 1990s, there was an idea to expand the old beachfront portion of the park. A new water park, to be called Splash World, would be placed on the site. Splash World was to include a kiddie play area, lazy river, dueling indoor tube slides, and a family raft ride. The expansion would open on time with the park for the 2003 season. This would prove to be a great addition to the park, but management still knew that they needed to add a brand new thrill ride. Following the removal of the carousel, an accident would occur that would change the park forever. On August 5, 1998, Three people were injured while riding the Jackrabbit coaster. The coaster is known to have derailed, crashing into the park's management offices right next door. Officials claim that the ride operator planned to allow the train to run more than one circuit, so he disengaged the automatic brakes and allowed the train to pass through three sets of brakes, but he forgot to slow the train down manually. As it rounded an area of track near the office building, the train was going too fast for the turn and derailed. Left work, got home. Turn the television on and see what the news is, and I'm watching aerial footage, and they're talking about a roller coaster accident. And I'm like, wow, that's uh, <laughs> quite unusual. Uh, it's one of it was one of ours. I mean, Jack Rabbit has our cars on it. Uh, company built it um, uh, with John Miller. So, anyways, I watched the news footage and. The next day, I was like, okay, we'll let things settle for a bit, and nobody called. And then uh, I drove over to Camden, uh, over to uh, uh, Blackwood, and uh, just went to the front gate and said, hey, I'd like to see Larry Baker or G and the GM, anybody would be interested in talking to me, and here to see if I can help. And... Uh, they let me in, went to the office, and all the furniture was pushed aside. And there was a great big hole in the wall. It was 
it wasn't all the way through. It, it came in, pushed the wall enough in that it pushed the couch, a coffee table, and everything else. It just deplaced everything. So you're kind of walking in, and I think they were leaving it just until the insurance company got there. And I met. That was the first time I met Larry Baker. Um, they're like, what are you doing here? Why'd you come over? I said, I saw the news. Anything I can do to help you? Yeah, they said, uh, well, we got the car out and then we're looking at it. We're trying to figure out what's wrong. I said, okay, fine. Um, looked at the car, looked at the wall, hole in the wall. And then I got a tour of the park and they showed me all the different things they were doing. And it was pretty cool. And they said they'd be in touch. And about a week later, they called and said, well, we. We can't fix it, and we send it back. So they sent the train back to us, and um, it was pretty much damaged all the way through. And I basically told them that you know, for the cost of a new train is what it's going to cost just to repair this. So they opted to buy a new train. The 28-year-old ride operator who was running the coaster at the time was fired, arrested, and charged with violating public health and safety laws. He faced a $1,000 fine and three years in prison if found guilty, but nothing was ever updated on the proceedings. The three victims, who were all riding in the first car of the train, were treated at a local hospital and later released. According to the park's former ride director, many employees had complained to management about the problems with the ride's brakes. Operators and patrons complained that the trains would often pass through the brakes and come to a stop past the normal point of unloading, sometimes up to several times a day, leaving the operator no choice but to let the train make another circuit so that the passengers could be unloaded properly. Park officials confirmed that they had received such complaints, but that the ride was inspected by park maintenance workers in response to each complaint, and no evidence was found of mechanical error. Park management blamed ride operators for such incidents. Following the incident with Jackrabbit, the park wanted to appeal to families again. In the early 2000s, the park added a brand new children's area which featured an overhang to keep everyone in the shade. This area also included a petting zoo. The park would later add a Chance Rides Inverter, a Zamperla Kite Flyer, a Chance Rides Chaos, a Zamperla Demolition Derby, a Selner Turtle Whirl, and the largest addition, a replacement CP Huntington train, allowing the park to retire their older, aging train. As the 2002 season approached, the park was in for a treat. Jackrabbit had been experiencing mechanical issues for years at this point, and the coaster was practically on life support. The park's current management decided to leave the coaster standing but not operating, marking the end of the nearly 90-year-old coaster's operational life, which began in 1919. If it were around today, it would be one of the oldest operating coasters in the world. With Jackrabbit shuttered, many guests visiting Clementon agreed that the park needed a new coaster, and the management were well aware. But before this was to occur, the park had larger expansion plans. At nearly the same time the park was looking for a replacement for Jackrabbit, SNS Worldwide founded a brand new division, a wooden coaster division. By using some of their own employees and hiring people from the now defunct Custom Coasters International, SNS decided to try their hand at building wooden coasters. The first SNS wooden coaster was built in 2003 and appeared to be a success. This coaster was Timberhawk at Wild Waves Theme and Water Park in Washington State. In addition to being a smooth, well built ride, Timberhawk also came at a price cheaper than that of the competition. With this knowledge in mind, the owners of Clementon Park decided to purchase an SNS wooden coaster, not knowing the issues that would come to follow. The coaster they purchased would become the last of only four to be built by SNS Worldwide's wooden coaster division. From moving from CCI to SNS uh, wasn't a planned transition. I had uh, I had left CCI a few years prior, and then SNS had started up a wood coaster division. So. I had uh, just done some consulting um, for SNS for a few years and still had you know, my regular full-time job. So this is the original concept design for the Hell what became the Hellcat. So this was a, an area where uh, the owner really wanted to, the ride to go out over the lake as much as possible. So the original design uh, involved you know, a series of a lot of piers and a lot of bridge work to span out over the lake. Um, and the area of the station area was really more toward 
the uh, where the Tiger Circus Show was. Um, that was the original area that the owner had requested the ride to be located in. Subsequently, the cost of the um, the length of the ride was pretty excessive, and the cost of the the bridge work and the pilings was obviously a, a big cost as well. So uh, the second iteration of the ride came through. Uh, we decided to move the station to a different area uh, to keep the cost down and, and keep the length down. Um, this was the site that was chosen. Eventually became very similar to the location where it is now around the picnic pavilion and the station area was uh, also pretty similar. The final version of the ride is uh, largely as it is now. We decided to change the location of Lift Hill and have the first drop go down over the lake uh, and also the second drop has some pilings and goes out over the lake as well. Um, there was a little bit of changes on the final design after the sale. The helix uh, was switched to the other side and the station area had a crossover. But uh, this was eventually he did like the uh, the interplay with the with the log flume ride and uh, the fact that it did go out over the water twice and so this was the uh, final uh, concept design that was sold to the, to the park. Clementon's new coaster, revealed to be called Tsunami, was one of three wooden coasters SNS were building in 2004, and each would have its own set of issues. Rumors would leak from the construction site, including a claim that the steel supports for the coaster's second hill were delivered to the wrong park. It has been said that the lift hill for Avalanche, another SNS wooden coaster located in Wisconsin Dells, was sent to Clementon for use on Tsunami. This meant that they had put together the lift parts and shipped them all the way back to the Dells. It is unknown if the existing hill on Tsunami uses any of these supports, but this was only one of the many issues that plagued the ride. SNS reportedly used subgrade lumber to achieve the $4 million price tag a price very affordable for a wooden coaster above 100 feet that also had pilings into a nearby lake. The track was considered smooth enough for the time, but each transition felt off. Despite the difficulties with its construction, Tsunami opened in the summer of 2004 to rave reviews from coaster enthusiasts. It was a fun and intense ride, but not without its flaws. Guests would note the poor transitions into the near 90 degree overbank. Track issues like these would return to haunt the coaster in the future. Um, Larry Baker kept insisting that we built one train and it was slower than the other train. And I tell, there's no way we could do that. Everything is done in a production like matter. Everything's built the same. No, no, no. And I told him, you gotta, gotta get your guys underneath there. There's something wrong, something dragging. We, we take them apart from top to bottom, then we flip them over to take the wheels off. And with that, we see this clump, and what the heck is that thing? And we're poking at it, looking at it, and I figured out what it was. Here a woman's wig had come off and wrapped itself around one of the side wheels, seized it, and the wheel was flat spotted from just being drug around uh, the coaster. And I said, there's a reason why. Although it was well received by those who wrote it, Tsunami was not a success marketing-wise and did not attract the crowds management had hoped for. At the time of its opening, the coaster's name would attract some bad press after the deadly earthquake and tsunami which occurred off the coast of Indonesia in December 2004. This led park management to rename and remarket the coaster in 2005 to J2, also known as Jackrabbit 2. Following this, not much was done to the park. With the newly renamed J2 not bringing in the crowds, management faced a bitter reality. The only path forward was to put the park up for sale. In 2007, Clementon Park was bought by a small company that was founded with the sole purpose of purchasing the struggling park. Its name was Adrenaline Family Entertainment, and while they were a very new company in the industry, their staff was anything but. Being run by a former Six Flags manager and other ex-Six Flags employees, this new ownership seemed promising, and the public was open to a change. Clementon, New Jersey, January 10th, 2008. 
A new century of family fun awaits South Jersey and Philadelphia residents thanks to the recent acquisition of Clementon Park and Splash World by Edmond, Oklahoma-based Adrenaline Family Entertainment Incorporated. The 100-year-old family park will open on Memorial Day weekend in 2008 with new ownership, new management, a new logo, and millions of dollars in improvements, including a massive new Polynesian-themed multi-level aqua playland to be called Laguna Kahuna. The park will also extend the operating calendar, adding 34 more days of delight. Sweeping changes at the new Clementon Park and Splash World will begin with a beautiful new welcome sign on Berlin Road, featuring the family theme park's modified name, new logo, and dramatic lighting. Adrenaline Family Entertainment had some real talent on its team. Despite being a new company, the CEO and all managers had experience in the industry, so the future looked bright for Clementon Park. Their first course of action was to rename J2 into what we know it as today, Hellcat. Their second course of action would address the original Jackrabbit. The new management did not see the need to keep the dilapidated coaster rotting on their property, and having deemed it too costly to refurbish, demolished it in 2007 to make room for future developments. After standing motionless since 2002, Jackrabbit was finally being put to rest. Adrenaline Family Entertainment had numerous plans for the future of the property, and wanted to grow as a company by assembling a portfolio of regional amusement parks. They would acquire Alabama Splash Adventure as well, the first in what was intended to be a long list of sister parks to Clementon. However, these ambitious plans would not come to be, and Adrenaline Family Entertainment's last addition to the park was a Larson Drop Tower, known as Thunder Drop. This attraction was not even permanent, and was merely placed down onto the pavement, making it obvious that the owner's funds were running out. Adrenaline Family Entertainment would sell the park in 2011, bringing an end to their ownership of Clementon Park. Sadly, despite a team of experienced employees, they could not afford to run the historic property. Following Adrenaline's brief time operating Clementon Park, it was time for another team of Six Flags employees to have a stab at running one of the country's oldest amusement properties. In 2011, Premier Parks acquired Clementon Park. Press releases at the time stated the following. Clementon Park and Splash World, one of the nation's oldest amusement parks, has been sold to an entertainment group led by former Six Flags executives. They plan to improve the venue, which debuted in 1907 on the banks of Clementon Lake, but revealed no specifics in an announcement made Monday. The buyers are Kieran Burke, former Six Flags CEO, and Gary Story, the company's former chief operating officer. Terms of the deal were not disclosed. We are excited about the opportunity to enhance the entertainment value of this historic park that has always enjoyed a strong group outing business and local market visitation, Burke said in a statement. Premier Park's first course of action was to expand Clementon Park's most popular area, Splash World. The new owners hired Aquatic Design Group, a company well known for designing and constructing water parks, to design a brand new area for Splash World. Called Big Wave Bay, this area would include a new wave pool as its main attraction. Around this time, a drop slide called Torpedo Rush was also added to the park. Although these investments made a good first impression, not much else was done after this during Premier Park's ownership, and an era of stagnation occurred until the year 2019. The year was a step in the right direction from Premier. The park was to add four attractions to its lineup. These included a Tilt-A-Whirl, a Scrambler, and a brand new kiddie pirate ship from SBF Visa. The fourth edition would be the park's first ever kiddie coaster. Relocated from the recently closed Bowcraft Playland in North Jersey, this Wisdom Rides Dragon Coaster was a fun and small family ride, and locals who had visited Bowcraft were happy to see it find a new home. Grown up in New Jersey, and I've only been to Clement Par Clementon Park twice. Um, I went once in 2007 when I was 11 years old during summer camp, um, and then later in 2019, I finally went back so down in South Jersey, so I just haven't, hadn't been down that way in a long time. Um, and I guess I got really lucky because I got to ride Hellcat right before it closed. Um, but I just remember Hellcat being like one of the roughest wooden roller coasters I had ever ridden. Um, and I think that's just because of, it kind of just shows the state of where the park was at the time. And Hellcat has, definitely has a lot of potential as a roller coaster. The layout's really nice. Um, it just needs some work, some refurbishment, and then it could probably be like a you know, like towards a top tier wooden roller coaster. And then, you know, there's some other rides there. They have a nice log flume. They have another kitty coaster. Um, if they just kind of fixed it up and just made it have like a nicer presence and vibe, 
I think it would be a really nice park, and I think they'd attract a lot more enthusiasts and just people in general. And I think it could be like a nice park in southern New Jersey. The future looked promising for the small park, but this optimism would be short-lived, as quite literally out of nowhere, Clementon Park would end operations only a week before the end of its summer season. On September 25th, there were reports of park employees showing up to help with the scheduled fall festival. Security turned them away and said they were closed. No announcements were made anywhere, just a cancellation. The popular online news website Screamscape said this on the matter. Today I received a report from an anonymous source telling us that on Monday, park owner Kieran Burke arrived on site and gathered all of the park's year-round full-time staff and informed everyone that they were being let go and final checks were handed out. For all intents and purposes, Clementon Park appears to be no more. But is it closed for good? Or perhaps we have to ask if the park is in the middle of being sold to a new owner, or even a land developer. It was indeed true about the Premier Park CEO coming to shut down the park, giving the employees their final paycheck and leaving. The general manager was left to search for a new owner himself as Premier had to figure out what to do with the property if a buyer was not found. November 2019, I started planning this documentary, waiting patiently for the time I would be allowed back inside the park. Time passed and no news of real buyers. The COVID shutdown happened and the property went bankrupt. Receivership from the bank in early 2021. Being closed now for almost two full years, sitting, waiting for a new owner, waiting for that slimmer of hope. March 20th, I myself was given a tour throughout the property. I was the last public person allowed inside the park before auction. The exact day after my tour was the auction. The log flume never got a bid, and Hellcat was being sold for only $40,000. At the end, the park sold for a mere $2.35 million. It was surprising, relieving, and scary. I didn't know who bought the park and what their plans were. But on March 24th, I found out. The buyer was Gene Staples. Gene had helped buy out Indiana Beach when it went into bankruptcy, reopening that park back in 2020. It seemed he wanted to do the same thing again to another historic park. Though I did not get to interview Gene for this documentary, I want to say thank you to him. Thanks to you, this dying breed lives to see another day.